Thank you for joining us. I know this is one of the last sessions of the day, hence the sparse population. Hopefully, tomorrow will be better. And how how's your day been going so far? A lot of sessions. Interesting content, meaningful content. Good. So folks, uh, we are here to talk about big data today. And we have a panel of really, really esteemed colleagues, uh, a PhD in theoretical physics, a surgeon, and an MIT grad. I mean, I don't really even have to go into the bios to tell you how awesome their background is. <laughs> and the kind of things that they have done, it's really phenomenal. So I am Uday Tekumala. I am a marketing director at Dell Software, and I own our solutions marketing group for Big Data. My personal introduction, I've been with Dell for about four, a little over four years now. And I've uh, been in the data space my entire career. I started off my career as a database developer several, several moons ago, and have tr transitioned through product management and strategy before landing up in marketing several years ago. So I've seen data from several different perspectives. I've even worked for data providers like Dun & Bradstreet, so I even have a little bit of experience from a, a data vendor standpoint. And today we are here, though, to talk about big data. It's come a long way. And like I say, you, I like to say that it's come from the basement, which is what it was personally for me. I was working at a, when I started my career, my very first gig, I was working for a very large financial institution. They showed, they shunted the entire database team, right from data analysts to DBS to developers like myself. We were all holed up in a small part of the basement. They were quite almost literally trying to hide us from the rest of the organization, right? And now look at the, the difference that data has made. Right, you cannot have a strategic conversation, a business conversation with C-level execs, and oftentimes with CEO, CEOs also, without data entering into the picture. Right? So it's come a very long way. And a lot of that has been because of the evolution of the tools in this space, the evolution of technology in this space. And one thing I should tell you is just the, the definition of big data as we go about this process. right? Because if you talk to five people, you're likely to get six different definitions. So we want to make sure that we are all on the same page. How we define big data at Dell is about any and all data that you need to make a business decision. It doesn't matter if that's coming from a structured source like, like Oracle or an unstructured source like Hadoop, whether that's a sales data set or the marketing data set or which BU it belongs to. If you need that data to make a decision, that's big data for you. And we are seeing that increasingly more and more organizations are adopting the same definition. In a recent survey that uh, both Dell did and a third party analyst did, we saw that over 80%, 80, that's with an eight, 80% 80 of the organizations are using some form of structured data as their primary big data source. That is saying a lot, right? That's definitely big data becoming mainstream when you're starting to adopt existing technologies. So why are organizations, oop, that's not right. We should not be jumping to thanks right from the get go. All right, let's see. All right. So guys, with that, let me allow me to, with that introduction, let me introduce our panelists as well. And I'm going to read out their bios, just so I, I want to make sure that I'm doing justice to them. So Timothy Alosi, our first panelist here. Timothy has over 20 years of process automation, operations management, and data analytics experience in the biologics industry with leading companies such as Sanofi, Genzyme, and Emerson Process Management. Currently, Timothy is the head of Global Data Analytics Solution Center for Sanofi's uh, information systems, industrial information systems. The Global Data Analytics Solution Center develops and maintains solutions for process data analytics, process analytical technologies, equipment analytics, and energy analytics that are deployed and used globally by Sanofi's over 110 international manufacturing facilities. Prior to his work at Sanofi and Genzyme, Timothy was VP of Operations Management and Manufacturing Intelligence at the local Emerson Process Management representative, New England Controls. Timothy has a degree in chemical engineering from MIT. Do you want to add anything to that, Timothy? No. <laughs> Next up is Dr. James Cromwell. Dr. Cromwell is a clinical associate professor at the University of Iowa, where he serves as the associate chief medical officer, director of surgical quality and safety, and director of the division of gastrointestinal surgery and a faculty member in the interdisciplinary graduate program in informatics. That's a lot of jobs. <laughs> Dr. Cromwell obtained his medical degree, general surgery training, and surgical infectious disease training at the University of Minnesota Medical School where he was honored with the Minnesota Medical Foundation Distinguished Resident Teaching Award. 
He completed a fellowship in colon and rectal surgery at the University of Texas at Houston. He has been recognized as one of the top surgeons in the US by Castle Connolly and US News. One focus of both his research work and practice has been the application of predictive analytics at the bedside, and we'll, we'll talk about that today. He received the Innovation Award for, uh, from the University of Tennessee Research Foundation in 2011, and the Innovator Award from the University of Iowa Research Foundation in 2012, both for applications of predictive analytics in medical devices for improving surgical care. Our final and, and, uh, panelist here is Paul Calleja from University of Cambridge. Paul obtained his PhD in computational biophysics at Bath University. After filling a post-doctoral research position at Birkbeck College, he moved into the private industry, where he spearheaded early commercialization of the HPC cluster solutions within the UK. After six years in the commercial sector, Paul returned to the academia to lead the new HPC service at Imperial College in London. From there on, in 2005, he moved to the University of Cambridge to form a new HPC service with university-wide capabilities and novel pay-per-use cloud computing model. The University of Cambridge now boasts of one of the largest academic supercomputers in the world. It has won awards for energy efficiency and has industrial sponsorship from Rolls-Royce, Mitsubishi, and heavy industries. Paul is now responsible for the University of Cambridge's research computing uh, services across all academic disciplines. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with, you, with us today. And let's jump right in. So, okay, so some of the basics, right? Like why are organization, organizations adopting big data in such a big way, right? This is a very new data point that organizations that are using data effectively are growing 50% faster than organizations that are not. So that's the, the first data point that we're talking about. And we saw a slight jump in terms of you know, the organizations that understand the benefits of using data. It's amazing to me that in 2015, we still have organizations that 58% organizations still don't see the benefit of data, but you know, this shows that we have a long way to go. I don't know if you've seen Michael Dell's uh, talk and his uh, blog post about data being the new economy. Right? We are in a space where data is becoming your, your best and your most important currency, and that's why we're saying invest wisely, right? So be careful with what you do with data. We have Dell's uh, chief privacy officer here too. There are definitely a lot of ramifications of not doing that properly, but if you use it properly, it can be very, very profitable. Here's another data point. Even 10 years ago, this slide would have looked very different. This was a question that was asked to about 12 or 1,300 IT leaders and 12 to 1,300 business leaders, and trying to get a sense for who is sponsoring big data projects in your organization. Even 10 years ago, it probably would have been 4x the number for IT than what we are seeing here today. Today, 16, one six of the 16% of the projects only are being sponsored by, by, by IT. Why is that, right? So a lot of that comes down to what are you really trying to do with big data, right? It really comes down to what is your objective and it needs to start there. And a lot of these cases, what you see is your objectives and your overall goals of the project are being defined by your business leaders, by your CMOs, by the chief sales officers, by C or V of whatever from a business standpoint. So, before we get into our discussion with our panelists, I just want to quickly draw out how we talk about big data as Dell. And you might want to scoot up front a little bit if you cannot see it in the background. So our entire thing starts off with you need to have a use case. And this is variously talked about as having business sponsorship or having a use case that you're targeting or a very specific business purpose that you're solving for. And you'll hear all of our panelists echo that. Once you have that, you've got to figure out what are the analytics you need to solve for that business problem. Because once you know business problem, you have kind of sense of where you want to land up at in terms of your analytics, what are your questions you're trying to answer. As part of that, you'll figure out what are the various data sources that you have that you likely would have to integrate in order to do that analytics. Because like as we might, we will not have all the data sitting in one place neatly. In order to do data integration properly, you need to have 
very good and effective data management techniques. What I mean by data management there is you've got to be able to store the data properly, you've got to be able to access the data properly, and then provision it properly. If you have data sitting on a tape drive somewhere in an offsite facility, awesome from a business backup standpoint and continuity standpoint, but you get zero marks from an analytics standpoint because I cannot access the data. You cannot access the data. And finally, a very important aspect which a lot of other organizations and vendors tend to forget about is infrastructure. These are fairly newer technologies, and their demands are much higher and greater than what we've seen in the past. So if you don't have the infrastructure capabilities to deal with the new age analytics and data integration and data management capabilities, your entire system can come to a standstill. This is what we like to call as our Dell Big Data Wheel. And that is what I have drawn up on the next. That's what we have there. So, guys, with that background, I want to turn over to our panelists. And this is a question for all, all three of you. Just to set the stage a little bit, if you can describe the, the initiatives that you've been working on, the projects you've been working on, and take like two to three minutes each to describe that, and then we'll dig a little deeper into the quadrants and what you guys did there, just to set the stage so our audience knows where you're coming from. So, Timothy, why don't we start with you? Sure, so a little bit about uh, Sanofi, right? We're the fourth largest pharmaceutical manufacturer in the world. We have uh, over 100, 107, 110 plants. So, my process data analytics program, uh, you know, it started with just really understanding, you know, some of the basic use cases that we're targeting. And unlike maybe some of the other analytics, uh, especially some of the stuff my fellow panelists will talk about, we did not approach the very complicated analytics first. We really are taking uh, a different approach, which is to make uh, the easy stuff as easy as possible so that we can deploy this broadly, very broadly, um, you know, our goal would be to every plant. That's going to take a little while. Uh, to do that, you know, our focus area, at least on the wheel, is, is much on the data integration and the data management, right? So those two elements, we spend 60 to 70 percent of our time uh, finding the data, connecting to the data, uh, and then also ensuring that we're respecting the business logic so that when we pull data out, we know it's the right data, we know the state of the data so that our users can trust it. Uh, as well as uh, providing context so that, um, well, most systems, right, put data in a certain context that's specific to how the system collected the data. Not very likely that that's the context that a lot of your analytical users want. So that data management, getting that into the right context is, uh, is also a fair amount of our effort. Excellent. Uh, so. From my perspective, the, the, the approach that we took with analytics is sort of a bottom-up approach. We were very heavy at the beginning. Uh, so, so it, my prism is through quality and uh, safety, and so we were very interested in improving quality and safety throughout the UI healthcare organization. And so um, we had a number of different issues that we wanted to solve where we felt like predictive analytics could help us. Um, things like surgical site infection, um, staffing models, um, a variety of other other applications, uh, but our larger organization did not have an infrastructure for doing this. So we really built a, 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 a an infrastructure to be able to do a, a sort of a proof of concept and then sort of work on driving that through the organization. Um, so we've been very heavy on use case on the actual analytics component in healthcare. Obviously, there's a there's a there's a drive to make sure these analytics are working properly. They're validated very you know uh, very well. Um, um, and so that's where we spent a great deal of our time. So um, within Cambridge, I, I think it's fair to say we started off more on an infrastructure play. So we have large infrastructure for compute and data storage. So we probably have around 15,000 cores on the floor and somewhere around seven petabytes of parallel file system. Of course, that then just moves the problem on to the next phase, which is in terms of data management. So then once you have all that data in big buckets, you need to start to think about what's in the buckets and how is it structured. And then once we have the more structured, kind of managed data uh, infrastructure, we look to deploy analytics tools on top of that 
mainly driven by particular customer needs in the next gen sequence arena. So we have some really large gene sequencing projects mm -hmm. that we're working on that are producing very high amounts of data to be analyzed. And then we needed to deploy some Hadoop infrastructure to start working on that data more efficiently and driving that, those data pipelines. Excellent. Fred, each one of you referenced a few projects that you guys did that brought you along on this journey. Can you describe what your favorite project was or what your best project was? Some of the results that you saw that came through as a result of that. And also about what your role is in that, in the larger scheme of things with that project. Like what is the role specifically you're playing? And then that'll give us a little bit more to go into for the business side of things. I will. So, um, I think the most interesting project we've worked on recently, again, is in the life sciences. Mm -hmm. We are partnered with uh, a government-owned company called Genomics England, which has a task to sequence 100,000 patients with some rare disease state. So my team is helping to create the software stack to <coughs> undertake that genomics analysis. And this is really pushing genomics software into a new space in terms of volume. So we really need to start thinking about new uh, high throughput software technologies to enable that analytical pipeline to run within a reasonable time frame. And that's, and still, that's still ongoing, the software is not completed yet. Got it. And we're using Spark infrastructure I see. to drive that. And just to add some color to that, uh, if you want to describe what you guys do, because your model is, your business model is fairly unique. Yeah, so, so obviously the main day job is, is driving discovery processes within the university. So, you know, computational workload, data analytics workload for research groups within the university, but we also have a mandate to take those services externally to SMEs within the UK to help, you know, small and medium enterprises use HPC to help mm -hmm. them get to grips with data analytics. And about 30% of our uh, income now comes from external revenue from, from industry cool. in driving, you know, their adoption. And this particular example that you just gave, Paul, so that, what was your role in that? How did you... So, Genomics England is a, it's a company, but it's a company owned by the NHS. So it's, so it's the, the kind of private, it's the public sector, really. And uh, as going our role there is to, we've been subcontracted to help them develop their software stack and really push Hadoop and Spark technologies into the genomics uh, software stack. That's reasonably novel. So um, I think, like Paul, the current project we're working on, of course, is the most interesting. <laughs> Keep the eye on the prize, right? The, um, one of the things that we found through the last couple of years is we found that if we continue to try to deploy our analytics uh, in a traditional way, that the time and effort to do that was really going to impact our ability to deploy m more broadly. So we worked with the business um, over the last 18 months to really come up with what we call convention-oriented analytics. And the goal there is by working with the business to harmonize their business process, harmonize the KPIs that they are um, calculating, harmonize the approach to process trending, that we could actually centrally develop and deploy uh, uh, analytical engines, they're actually based off of Dell Statistica, that um, <coughs> are mapped in with uh, a set of master data that the business provides that defines their process, defines their parameters, defines their specifications, and then merges those things in to do, those, uh, do the analytics dynamically. Now, we can only do this with the basic analytics, but like I said earlier, our approach is to make the basic analytics as uh, accessible as possible. Right. Um, so that one right there is really interesting because we're looking at that to reduce our cost of deployment by 75 percent wow. um, for a site. So and what are the primary drivers for uh, that cost reduction? So um, the primary drivers is, is we, the uh, industry that I'm in with pharmaceutical manufacturing requires that you, uh, because it's, it's part of the operational uh, manufacturer medicines, it requires that uh, platform and the analytics and the configuration and any software develop, we develop is fully validated. So if you would take an average project of say $100,000, if you do that average IT project in this environment, in GMP environment that requires validation, you're looking at a cost closer to $250,000 or two to, two to three X 
what the IT cost is. So along those lines, if you think about the total cost of ownership and the continuous need to keep the system validated, so every change, if it's a 10 minute change, it could be eight hours of compliance work to ensure that 10 minute change gets deployed. When you look at those sorts of costs and barriers, you realize you have to change the game or you're not, you're gonna just collapse under the compliance weight. Right, and you're using Statistica for that, right? We are using Statistica and LiveScore server for the, um, for the, what I would say, the statistical processing power and the notifications, alerts, KPI generation. Got it. And your role in the process is as a analytics leader? Um, yeah, so my role is uh, I'm the IT sponsor on that side, okay. and I work with our partner on the business side who's also the sponsor, and then um, my team has got the, uh, the technical lead leadership role on the, on the technical side, working closely with Dell. Got it. Excellent. And Dr. Cromwell? So I think the, the probably the most gratifying projects that we've worked on are the ones that, um, you know, we, we're doing analytics at different levels. We can do population health. We can do um, operational improvement. We can reduce diagnostic and treatment errors. Uh, but probably the most gratifying has been the work we've done, at least up till now, is on surgical site infections. And um, we, when we started um, bringing pr predictive analytics into, uh, into our um, environment, uh, we wanted to choose sort of a high um, profile problem, a problem that, that would really get our um, senior leadership and UI healthcare's attention as to the value of predictive analytics. Surgical site infections happen to be the most costly and most common um, in hospital acquired infection. So we chose that as the project to work on. And um, th this all started out, you know, it, we've iterated through a number of different ways of doing this. We started out writing R code and then, you know, eventually needed to get to a, a better way to deploy these and then and recalibrate the models. Um, so we, you know, eventually moved into a, a statistical enterprise system to do that. Um, but so that, that's been very successful and gratifying because we've been able to, through a highly analytics driven process, reduce surgical infections by about 74% over three years, um, which has, you know, uh, saved a lot of money. But more importantly, we have a, a lot more satisfied patients um, who, who really have a much uh, quicker recovery from, from procedures that we do. Um, my role in all of that has been, you know, initially I've sort of played the role as the analyst and the content expert with regard to the, the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, as we've moved on, we've trained a small cadre of uh, surgery residents, medical students like, uh, and, and other trainees who are interested in this to uh, start uh, moving into those analytics roles. Um, and so we have a, a, a slightly larger group of people doing that so I don't have to do all the analytics work. So you would be what we traditionally describe as a business leader or the business sponsor of this whole initiative. Do you have an IT team that's backing you up on this? Yeah, we have, um, there's really three people, you know, we, 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 have, a, we have a content expert, which either is, could either be myself or, or a, another physician, um, an analyst, um, which again could be myself or another, you know, data science person, informatics person, and then we also have a data applications developer who's very familiar with the underlying systems in the in our enterprise. That's sort of the day-to-day -day working team. But then we take advantage of of a number of the broader IT team members who manage network permissions and uh, storage and all those other issues on a on a sort of ad hoc basis. Okay. And what about you, Paul? We didn't actually touch upon that. Like, talk about your, your ecosystem. Who does what? Who are the other stakeholders that you work with? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm the director of research computing, so, you know, all the activities of the team are pulled up to myself. We sit within a much larger IT organization, so networks and infrastructure provided by all parts of the team. But it's myself and my, you know, my direct team that, that work with research stakeholders to define the problem mm -hmm. and then come up with IT solutions for that problem. So you have analytics experts on your team yeah. too? Yeah. Excellent. So, and guys, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. It, it needs to be more interactive. If, uh, it can be more interactive if you want it to be. So what I find interesting is that we have, uh, so typically what we've seen is that there's data science or analytics roles, right? So and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it can be reporting up into IT, it can be reporting up into business. And in this case, we are seeing the, both, right? So with Tim, it's you guys sit under the IT organization, and same for you, Paul. Whereas for Dr. Conwell, you are more on the business side of the things. And that's pretty powerful for the course. We are, I would say though, we are seeing a trend 
towards the decision sciences and the analytics teams, reporting up more into the business side of the house. Dell internally, we did the same thing. In fact, I just was in another session with our VP of analytics, the Dell analytics team. And we moved, we've developed a co-development model with our IT teams. So there is a BI council and analytics council that is led by the business leader. And that has representation from both the IT side of the house and the business side of the house. And anything, any data related decisions that are made are made in that council. So everybody gets to have a say. So this is our way of embracing shadow IT, if you're familiar with that. Go ahead. As it relates to that, what the, which team really has ownership of it or champions it, I'm the construction industry. IT, I run IT departments, so I get the big data and the bigger picture, the strategic plans and the long term. When I see our end users want to do it at, from the business side, they're looking at it at the micro level and can't are you guys, do other people in bigger industries have a better sense of looking at it from the business side or is someone from IT trying to mentor that person or those teams to say, here's how to look at the big picture, look at the big data because right now when people have asked us IT for data, they're looking down here versus up top and so there's a disconnect. So everything that's happened has really been more from the IT side in, our, in my world. Uh, to add to that, like, uh, one of my questions was attached to that realm trying to solve when you guys started the project when you know this is the business objective we needed to solve or you went on the journey for data integration and management and then along the way you uh, you use the tool and find out yeah this is the solve problem I can solve as well. So, so two okay. different uh, so two questions right so just in case you couldn't hear it at the back the first one was about IT seems to be taking the leadership role with big data business users when they come in they are tackling with uh, data level and really low level problems how do you make sure that these two things are in sync with each other and I'll come back to the other question too so I mean I think from my my perspective is different from from these guys in that um, we were you know we're very focused on a set of uh, problems and outcomes that patients have in the hospital and um, and as such, we're you know looking at a very granular level at those issues. But uh, you know our approach has been to to build the sandbox infrastructure to do this, and then push on our larger IT organization to look at the look at what we built and learn how to scale this because we know we're going to need to scale it. And and so um, we're we're serving as a sort of a laboratory for our larger IT group essentially. And in fact, uh, that actually might answer your question too. The second question was about how do you, where do you start? So in this journey, like the way I outlined it, you start with a business case, start with your challenge that you're trying to solve for, then go around the wheel starting with analytics, data integration management and infrastructure. So is, does that actually how it works for you guys too? So if you can tackle both. Yeah, so our funding model dictates normally that we have a, a customer with a, with a known problem mm -hmm. that we that has funding for us to solve that problem so uh, and and in the process of solving that problem for that customer we can then leverage that infrastructure to demonstrate to a wider set of customers the utility of this kind of system and then leverage incremental funding and a, and a broader set of problem spaces to tackle but normally we need a use case to kick the process off then the business side of the organization can see the potential of analytics, right. then they can, you know, then they can imagine what classes of their problem this can tackle, and that releases more funding. But normally, right. there needs to be a reason to kick it off. Right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I actually agree, and, and I think we're actually pretty well aligned. We really do need to start with the use case, 100%. Now, what I've found is a little bit different because. I'm on the IS organization, right? But I'm an industrial IS. And we're like one foot in the business. Matter of fact, we report up to the business. We don't actually report up through the IT, the separate shared services. Okay. Uh, that could change, of course, at any given time. <laughs> <laughs> but so, and, and we had this conversation right after lunch. You know, it's interesting because you take a look at big data and I've got, I'm on several big data workshops. <laughs> and the problem is, is we've got our global IS guys going, Hadoop, 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 right? And they're going, and, I'm, and I feel like, these are guys that have this big hammer and they're looking for a nail. And, you know, and then they come up and they're talking to me and I'm a little closer to the business and I'm like, well, I've got the nail. And they're like, well, let's hit it. I'm like, wait a second. I don't know what we're building yet. Are we building a house, a barn, a garage, a bridge? 
So I, I'm, I'm still finding that although we can be, as an IS organization, we can enable, it had to start from some basic needs at the business. And then I agree 100% with you, Paul, is once we get that capability in place, and we start to have some success, then it starts rolling. And I think that's really, you know, for me, it's been a little bit more ground up. And, um, uh, you know, I think it has, you have to find some visionary person in the business that really has a passion to drive this. Uh, sometimes it can come from the top. Most times it's coming from the bottom. And, and, and uh, you know, those are the guys that don't see necessarily the big picture, and you've got to help them and guide them but they, they're going to be the ones with the passion to solve some problem that they can't solve any other way. And that, so thank you for the raising question. It's, it's aligned to some of the questions being asked earlier. So there's other ways to attack big data problems. You can use like a Teradata, for example. Sure. Why did you pick to do the, uh, solve and work on some of these problems? And then secondly, um, big data has an affinity to the type of analytics tools that you're using. Did your uh, organization or your population have I'll start. We don't use Hadoop. <laughs> so, uh, most of our data management is still in traditional RDBMSs. Uh, we do a lot of work on the data management side with TIBCO. Um, and for our IoT type of stuff, we're in a, in a, a Aussie soft, OSI soft uh, data store. So we actually don't. For, for me, I would always push back to GIS. It's like, okay, hold on, guys. When we figure the rest of this stuff out, we'll come and let you know if we think Hadoop can help. So for us, we think there's a lot of technologies, and it's really more about the data itself and not the technology. We, well, I, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. We're sort of the same. We're using traditional relational databases, and um, uh, we, we're using Statistica because we're sort of trying to wedge our analytic system into existing architecture, and, and, and this is a tool that plays well with all the stuff that's already there. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a mixed play. I mean, Hadoop for the genomics pipelines was a, was a good fit in terms of MapReduce and the algorithms that we wanted to deploy. So, and, and it's a scalable in a distributed architecture that fits our model. And actually, we're moving on to Spark now, so because the MME uh, capability of Spark gives us a big leap in performance. So we, we tend to choose uh, models that fit the problem space uh, uh, and, and do it that way around. Uh, there is another piece of work that we're just starting now, which is integrating Hadoop with Statistica to make that capability mm -hmm. accessible to a wider group of non-analytics experts within the university. So we, we have a you know, wide range of domain experts in lots of different domains. Most of them are not statistical experts. And of course, the, the real benefits will, will come when we make these technologies accessible to non-statistical domain experts. Right. And, and statistics that is, pretty is quite useful, possibly, in that we would, with, you know, useful to right. low in the barrier of entry to non-experts. I do have a follow-up. One other thing, though, is, and, and this is something that I've been evangelizing a little bit within our organization, is we don't currently have a good data strategy. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a good, you know, we have all this data that sits in, I, I don't think, we have maybe, oh my goodness, <laughs> 4,000 different applications, something like that. <laughs> wow. 4,000 unique different applications, something like 100,000 servers. Um, we don't have a data strategy, and I've been trying to I've been trying to evangelize this need because as the as the analytics guys, I'm fighting all the time. We're trying to pull data out of all these different source systems, and it's the same conversation. I'm so bored with having this conversation. Um, so really, like for me, the vision I would love to have is each source system would publish a certain set of data, a certain common data sets that the business asks they need. In that case, there, if they could put it into that classic data lake. I, don't, I wouldn't care what the technology is, but if I had a lot less work to go get all the data, I'd be a lot happier. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I think the technology could really benefit, something like a Hadoop distributed type of mm. infrastructure. But for us, until we get that data strategy in place, it's you know cart and horse. Right. And that's pretty consistent with what we see with other customers too. Right? So five years ago, probably there was a very strong correlation between big data projects and Hadoop. 
that's really not the case anymore. Right? Hadoop might not be the right answer for you. There are a lot of other data platforms which might be the right answer. In fact, I would recommend you, uh, I think to, there's a session called MT56. Are you ready for the future of data technologies? That's a highly educational session where we are tackling some of these same uh, challenges. And I think we are covering Hadoop, Spark, NoSQL, and uh, SAP HANA. And talking about what are the pros and cons of each of those four different platforms, what are the use cases where you can use some of those, all that good stuff. So that might give you a little bit more insight into you know, what kind of uh, platforms you can use for your specific data need. But even internally within Dell, for example, we do use Hadoop quite a bit for the marketing data set. For the sales data set, we actually did not feel the need for it because a lot of it was existing structured data, so we use Teradata internally. Sorry, you had a question. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think I think there is. I mean, there is an ethical obligation to share uh, effective methods of reducing, you know, patient suffering and disease and everything. Um, we, uh, I mean, this is this has been uh, working with Dell's been a great platform for doing that. But you know, we we present these things at medical meetings all the time to try to share this data. And so, uh, over the last three years, I've been sharing this at medical meetings and everything around the around the country. Um, but part of it is is there isn't a great way, or at least there hasn't been up until now, a great way of saying someone who doesn't have the analytical capability to say, mm -hmm. here, take this model and use it. Um, you know, I think there, there's a lot of things going on right now that will change that. I mean, there's, you know, marketplaces for models that are popping up and, you know, things like that. Um, the, the medical record system that we use, Epic, is incorporating a, a predictive analytics module that will be possible to maybe even integrate some of these, these models into those systems. Um, um, but yeah, I, I agree. This has is, this is really transformed how we think about some of these things, whether surgical, surgical site infections, for instance, is taken for granted that's going to happen. It's going to happen to 15 to 20 percent of patients after intestinal surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, we've now demonstrated that that's not the case. Five or six percent of patients still get them, uh, but um, you know, uh, um, it doesn't have. You know, we don't have to settle for higher rates. Yeah. I was asking exactly the same question. We were near to taking this technology back to Cambridge. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So guys, let's talk about the Dell data maturity model. So like I said, we call it the all data maturity model. So we developed this primarily to help out our customers figure out where are they. Like you self-select yourself into which stage you're in. And there's going to be a white paper on this coming out uh, pretty soon, which will help you also figure out what are the challenges you can expect as you go about this process, and what are some of the capabilities that you would have to build in order to overcome those challenges. So for the to tee up our next part of the discussion, it's a fairly straightforward uh, model. The first stage is what we call as data aware. This is a stage at which organizations are manually compiling data from several different data sources. They do not have a standardized BI platform, and their entire goal is reporting. Right, let's just get reporting out to the senior executives because my, my neck is on the line. I was about to use a different body part, if you know what I mean. So uh, data proficient is the next level. That, those are the organizations which have realized that, you know what, this whole manually compiling thing is, is not really working out. We've got to invest more in our data systems. This is the stage at which they have invested in a standardized BI platform. And they have people who are running it, the senior management is bought into it, and their goal is to track the organizational KPIs, track the organizational goals using that BI platform. Third are organizations that we like to call as data savvy. These are organizations that have mastered the art of structured data, mastered the art of reporting. So they have done a few projects, they've done a few pilot projects with Hadoop and advanced analytics and predictive analytics. They've had successful pilots, and as a result, are now looking to scale out. 
right? They're saying, okay, let's take it out into specific project initiatives, specific data sets, and see where we can, what we can do with that. Last, the data-driven guys, that's like the mecca in the space, right? These are the guys who are, have embedded data and analytics into their day-to-day -day lives. Their entire business process is embedded with data and analytics. Think fraud monitoring, think risk, think credit, think Googles of the world or the Facebooks of the world. These are organizations who honestly cannot exist without data. Data runs their entire operations and their entire business. And that is who, and at that stage really, it's all about scaling because now you're thinking data, you wanna scale it out and you wanna take out cost, right? So everybody wants to be there, but honestly, everybody need not be there because it really depends upon what you're trying to do. If you are a manufacturing organization, you probably wanna be here from your operation standpoint. If you are a Dell, we wanna be here from an online e-commerce uh, companies especially. They wanna be here for their marketing data sets, but we probably don't have to be here for every single data set that we have, right? Same goes for every other organization, right? You gotta pick and choose what you wanna do your PhD in versus what you're okay with just going to high school for. Right, so that's kind of how we've broken it up. So my question to you guys would be, when you started out this journey, right? So when you, especially the projects that you just described or even the entire initiative, where were you when you started it off? And where, what's your goal? Where are you tracking to and all that good stuff? On this, anyone? Well, I'll start. Um, so when we first started off, we had pockets of probably what you would call data proficient spaces. and, and just to go back, again, we have 107 different plants, right? So a large percentage, majority of those plants were right in the data aware stage. Um, today, I think we've moved our IT organization and um, our basic capabilities into that data proficient state, okay? Now our leaders are starting to work on the data savvy stuff where they're answering and, and kind of starting to process more um, more of those uh, decision-based uh, data, data-driven decisions. But, you know, we still have a lot of laggards that are in this data-aware state, and then this is where our programs now are really focused on bringing those laggards up into just phase two, or state two, data proficient. Um, and then, you know, some of our, you know, leader, leading edge sites, they're gonna be ahead of the curve, and they're, they're gonna be ahead of the curve for a while. Right. Organizationally, I don't think we'll be able to get to data savvy for quite some time, because I think the benefit to the organization from going to step one to step two is pretty significant. And we can return a lot of data there with, say, you know, a known set of, of, uh, of uh, you know, budget and cost and stuff. So that's where our focus is. I wish we were further along. <laughs> Um, so when I arrived at the University of Iowa in 2009, we were probably pretty clearly uh, data aware. You know, most exchange of data was Excel files being passed around by email. Um, uh, we rapidly, I think, moved to data proficiency uh, through standardized reporting um, mechanisms and things like that um, throughout the organization. Uh, we now, I would say, have pockets that, are, that represent all four of these stages within the organization. Uh, we have groups like mine that are really, uh, really data driven at this point, and we have still laggards that are in this data aware stage. I'm just trying to be diplomatic now. <laughs> 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 in case my sponsors are watching. Um, most of the university actually is, 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 I'm afraid, in the data aware section of the, uh, of the graph. The IT organization itself that I work within. I would think is also in the data aware part of the graph. There are pockets of excellence in certain research groups that would be data driven, but as a whole, I would say that the organization is, has got a long way to go. Would you say the customers that you're serving with your HPC clusters, are they more towards the right yeah, side of this? Yeah, there are some research groups where, of course, their whole activity is data driven, and right. we work with them to deploy quite advanced technologies. They are really pockets or beacons of excellence in the yeah. university. Cambridge is very decentralized. Uh -huh. Okay, so it really lets people do what they want to do. It's, how, it's, it's, it's in its ethos to be decentralized. So, and that ethos of academic freedom filters down into the admin structures, i.e. freedom to do nothing in an organized or centralized <laughs> way at all. And that's a good thing. 
So it's, there's a lot of cultural change we need to go through to even get to be data proficient as an organization. Although, as I say, there are certain research projects that are highly data driven and are really kind of world leading in their infrastructure, but that's the isolated beacons. So, Paul, what would you say were some of the biggest challenges you faced <laughs> in phasing out from data aware to all the way through data driven? It's some of the pro uh, projects that you've done with your customers or internally. No, so the, the projects are different. So the, the projects really are driven because they have such large, you know, leading edge demands. Okay, so the, these are research projects really dealing with really large volumes of data where the outcomes cannot be provided unless they go to a data-driven model. So they're, technically they're challenging, but culturally they're they're relatively easy. The, the biggest problems are one of, of culture within mm -hmm. the organization. They're people problems, not technology problems. I always say that technology is easy. People are difficult. Tell me more. And, you know, and, and Cambridge in particular, because it's quite a historical organization with strange ways of working. <laughs> <laughs> Does that resonate with the audience, the cultural aspect? That's something that comes up very often in these discussions. That I can be talking to a CIO and the CIO is asking me, how do we effect change culturally, right? That's something that comes up very, very often and something that you do not ever want to ignore. If you have this nailed down right, that means that you have business sponsorship. And guess what? Those business leaders can help you effect change way greater than an IT leader coming in and trying to spread that love across the organization and saying, guys, let's use data. Right, that if there is a business sponsorship for your initiative and it's not a science project within IT, things, the, the change and the cultural aspect is, I'm not saying it's easy, yeah. but it becomes easier than what it would have been. Would that be, would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm new in the IT space, only three years, uh, and I, I just did a presentation just before this, and, and afterwards I was talking to a young IT guy. I said, the first thing you're really gonna learn, it took me a while to learn it, is you're not trusted. <laughs> <laughs> Just go into this. They don't trust you. They don't want you in the room. They, they don't have confidence that you can deliver, you know, what you say. And, and when I, I've heard so many times, if our process went down as often as our email did, we'd, ne you know, we'd be out of business. So, but as an, you know, we can be a very strong enabling technology, but finding that use case, finding those partners are, are critical. <laughs> Dr. Trump, from your perspective, what was the most challenging thing? Well, I think, I mean, culture is, again, from my perspective, the most challenging. Working um, s similar to the Cambridge problem um, is that surgeons, you know, physicians and surgeons specifically have such a high degree of autonomy that, that, that they're, um, we really have to um, provide a lot of, you know, proof and ROI and everything to, to really move the needle on, on how things are practiced. What about getting data in the first place? I know in medical settings that can be really hard. How did you overcome that? Um, when when we started this project, we we very you know the very first thing we did was to engage our chief information officer and and work on setting up a sandbox environment where they were very uh, comfortable with us working with all of this t data and not having to worry about it. You know. Uh, out on Facebook or whatever, so you know that um, you know, and as as they've gained confidence with what we're doing and seeing the results, they've you know um, uh, been able to provide us with you know additional infrastructure and everything for doing this. So, um, and and we're you know we've now got them on the course to do a very large analysis of our um, of our overall analytical capabilities for UI healthcare, so we can start sort of future proofing the organization for these things that are coming along. Thanks. Okay. So I've got a question for you. I just thought of so, so you can report back to the business and the monetary value that this brings in terms of uh, improved, you know, lower treatment costs. He, yeah, so well, we're seventy percent reduction equates yeah. to hard dollar at the end of the day. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good question. The, a surgical site infection, on average, for for the types of surgeries we're talking about, is averages twenty to thirty thousand dollars each, and so um, with a with a hospital that does you know over twenty thousand surgeries a year, the the number is 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 quite it's large. Yeah. yeah. So each of you are really technical visionaries, or you're at least um, solution visionaries for particular disciplines. What's next for each of you? What is the next? Do 
Um, for, for me, I mean, the, the, the first thing is, is um, figuring out how to scale the system in, in, a, in a complex healthcare environment. Um, but so, so that's sort of one is taking the solution that we already have and, and scaling it. The other, uh, we realize that we need, that, that, the, that outcomes for patients doesn't end when they leave the hospital. And we really want to be able to uh, continue to collect um, uh, data that will be important for modeling on these patients outside of the hospital where we can still have a chance to intervene uh, before a serious adverse event happens. Um, so one, one thing that, that we're trying to do right at this moment and into the next probably year or two is trying to build the architecture so that that patients can can um, enter that data, and we can build models that are effective outside the hospital. So for us, there's uh, <clears throat> probably three areas that we're looking at. One is just improving our analytical capability of the business, right, and continuing to try to enable more and more sophisticated models to be developed by the users with the current the current user base that we have. That's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, mobility is an area for us. Uh, with the number of employees that we have and you know we'll be looking at something like within a couple of years uh, over a thousand different analytical users so really being able to, to leverage the, the devices different form factors that's something that we have on our radar and the last thing is uh, a little pet project that I started a little while back is around knowledge management we call it data driven search I gotta come up with a better name but I hear often like we do the same thing over and over again because we forgot we figured it out already. <laughs> and this is really where you get uh, unstructured data, everything from tech reports, uh, research papers, um, you know, comments in batch records, comments in, um, in a event records like deviations and stuff. And then you have the, the process data, the raw you know, data that you normally can analyze well and trying to find a way to merge that into a dashboard where someone can you know, give it natural language type query like, hey, can, when were we using this vendor lot for this serum? And here's all the batches that had that, here's the lab results, here's a tech report that was written, and really bring that together. And we're actually looking at some, um, working with some technology out of Google to, to start doing that. But it's about knowledge management. And I say, the simple way I say it is, just remind me is of what we already know. And um, so that's an area that our users still, you know, struggle with. What are some of the technical capabilities, talking about those three things that you just outlined, Tim, what are some of the technical capabilities you would have to build? And let me actually broaden the question, both technical and business capabilities that you would have to build. Because I see a lot of organizations struggling with that, right? How do you scale analytics? How do you enable more people with mobile devices? And let's, not try, let's try not to forget things that you already know. <clears throat> Yeah, that's uh, the the let's not forget things that you you already know. That one's a that one's a tough one. I yeah. don't think anybody's doing that well right now. Um, our, we're really early in that, uh, but certainly core technologies like like uh, in, indexing and stuff is is tremendously powerful there. Uh, mobile, I think there's a lot of good progress being made on the technical side on mobile, and I think it's just getting all the vendors, especially in this space, to embrace it more. Um, we can't drive that, but I can ask for it all the time to Angela, which I do. Um, <laughs> Angela is a product manager for Statistica. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then on the, on the other one, you know, it's some training. And it's, we have some data scientists that are really good at developing the models. And if we're lucky, we have a third of probably what we need. So for there, I think it's more somewhere about training and just that one I don't know because it's not a technical problem. I mean, yeah, there's infrastructure issues, there's performance issues, that stuff there is there. But you know, really getting people to start changing how they think, and 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 then giving them the tools to train a neural net or train a, a model predictive control. These, you know, if you do it wrong, and I'm sure <laughs> you've probably done it wrong more Many than times, once. I know yeah. I have. When you do it wrong, it's bad, and so. But to do it right, it's a very specific skill set. So everything that we can do to help the users not make the common mistakes is really important, especially around the data preparation, the randomization, and all that other stuff. That is, if you do that wrong, you cannot get your models right. So, you know, and, and I think uh, the more that we have people adopt these technologies, the better off we'll be in, in finding techniques to in, enable the T 
tier two users or the tier three users and still have them be successful. You touched upon something else that's, uh, I, I like to talk about that quite a bit uh, also. It, so let me rephrase the, let me think about it slightly differently. How long did it take for each one of you to get along this journey? Like how long have you guys been doing this? Because God knows there are a lot of wrong ways to do it and we've all been there, right? And how long did it take for, how long was that journey for? And you don't have to give me an exact well, number, just. In, in, in Cambridge, I've been resident there for 10 years. Yeah. And uh, the HPC market is traditionally compute focused. Uh -huh. And the data centricity has really crept in without anyone noticing over the last five years until suddenly there's this mountain of data that needs to be dealt with and now we're playing catch up. So we're still playing catch up. We're not on top of the problem at all. Actually, the problem's growing faster than we are. So uh, my boss is not listening, which is good. <laughs> because I, 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 I think, you know, we are still very reactive. You know, we are not on top of it and it's getting worse. So we need to focus, you know, more on that problem. We now understand that the problem is on top of us. And we're having to, you know, all of our focus at the moment in terms of new initiatives is, is, in, this, is in this area. What about you, Dr. Um, I, I, I've been doing this uh, work working on predictive analytics since about 2008. And I think... Um, each successive proce uh, project that we've done, it's gotten easier for us to build the analytics, uh, basing it on the, the stuff that we've already created. I think the problem, uh, but it gets progressively harder because I think we've, we've, we've gotten the low-hanging fruit and we're, yeah. you know, we're looking for um, you know, uh, higher goals. So I think, and I'm pretty sure today is the three-year anniversary of me joining the, the organization because I've been getting all kind of LinkedIn notes today. Um, <laughs> But so I've been working about this uh, almost exactly three years. And where we are today is we've got a good infrastructure in place. We've got the tools in place. And now we're starting to, you know, how do we accelerate? So I, I don't think we'll ever be done. Um, and that's actually a good thing. Because if we're done, yes. that means they've killed the, pro the program. It doesn't mean that we've <laughs> successfully solved every problem. So I see this as, you know, really our goal is, is to just just shave off layers of problems, right? Get to the data, make the data analytics, the simple stuff easy, you know, start getting to the higher end stuff for your power users and then make mm -hmm. your power users, you know, expand that, that, um, that population. So, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't think we're ever gonna be done. Uh, three years, I think, is probably twice as long as it should take most organizations. But I think, um, that, I think that point you made, make the simple stuff easy yeah. is a really good, statement because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit and benefit to the mm -hmm. business that you can enable with that to yes. then give you the credibility and the funding <laughs> to do the next stage but yeah. I, I like that i'm going to use that with my boss and make the simple <laughs> stuff easy that's a, that's certainly a not good, something i coined that's a, that's a good one and we that's often see one. when organizations are trying to go after the low-hanging fruit and they're trying to make the simple things easy yeah. they will focus on data integration and data management because that is it's easy to effect change. It's easy to not get into discussions about who's right, who's wrong, did we meet the business goals? And that is something that you as IT can start doing internally as well, yeah. right? Because that's not something, you do need business sponsorship, don't get me wrong. Nobody's gonna cut a check for half a million dollars just because you wanna take up a project, right? So you would need to have that business case ready, but it's a lot easier to effect change here than the entire wheel. It's a lot harder to prove your ROI there. That's true. If you, don't, if you don't start with some basic analytics problem, just right. the data integration and the data management, is it, that's a hard problem to solve and, and it's hard to justify. Yeah, so these two things typically come up as part of some yes. initiative that's happening, but the majority of the focus is on fixing the, the pipes, right, the plumbing. And the, the point that you all made essentially, right, is that it's a journey. Big data is not a project. It's a way of thinking. It's a way that you embed and Im imbibe data and analytics into your organization and both yourself and culturally, right? So it's not something that you can say, I've done my big data project, big check mark and done, right? That, that's kind of, we've, we've moved past that stage. We could say that five years ago perhaps, but not really anymore. We're really uh, running out of time. So I'm gonna, I don't think I have any more. I mean, these are all, uh, you guys will have access to all these slides. I deliberately wanted to continue our discussion because that's a lot more interesting. And in terms of next steps, hang out here. We'll be here for a few more minutes. If you want to chat more, we're happy to do that. Definitely go down to the show floor. 
we have a huge presence in terms of big data booths and uh, analytics and integration data management infrastructure. So go talk to those folks. And yeah, three things, right? We talked about a lot of things today. The, the top things that if you remember nothing else, please remember, start with a use case, have a business sponsor. To break down those data silos, do not get caught up in Oracle versus Hadoop versus sales versus marketing. And three, remember it's a journey. It takes a while. It takes a long time. Right? So, Can I ask please. So, data dictionary, is that for keywords as one, or is it just, like you say, make the easy things practical? Yes. It's not a primary focus of my team, but I suffer without it. So I, I work really closely with our enterprise uh, bus TIBCO team. And um, we uh, historically have done a lot of point-to-point -point interfaces, and, which just kills me. Um, but that sort of canonical data model, that data yeah. dictionary, um, you know, you can certainly take it way too far, right? Don't spend a ton of time doing it. But we struggle with, we've got seven different limb systems. Essentially, it's all the same type of data represented tons of different ways. We've got multiple SAP systems. Multiple SAP systems, right? Again, essentially, we want the same type of data out of it. So, you know, the benefit of like a canonical data model is says all your limbs data is going to be represented in a, in a certain similar structure. And then uh, all your ERP material data or process order data is all going to be represented as a certain thing. It is something we're working on as we're trying to mature, you know, but like I said, um, um, it's different. I don't have all these source systems. I have the system that talks to all the source systems. So it, it, for me, sometimes it's like pushing a rope. But yeah, the canonical data model, I think, has a lot of value. And it goes back to what I was talking about with the data strategy. Those sorts of things can really enable and empower uh, an organization. I also fear, though, if you start there, you're probably never going to get anywhere because no one will agree. You don't have a use case. You're not sure why you're trying to do it. Uh, you can get away without it, and you can get away, especially in the in the yeah. first couple of years, without it. But as we're growing, we definitely see the value, and, and we're trying to educate. Matter of fact, my colleague is in France this week, really trying to convince convince um, some people that they need to do things a little differently. So, yeah, you run the same risk of trying to build a data integration platform without knowing what are you going to use it for. Right, so what, what is the data dictionary really being used for? So that's a yeah. great answer. Yeah. And I still think even with Hadoop and some of these things that just absorb everything, it's still, it's still an issue because you have to use MapR some way yeah, yeah. to make heads or tails and contextualize yeah, meta, meta data. Metadata languages in different mm -hmm. domains are, are really common. Of course, in your sphere, I know that it, it's very, there's a lot of domain metadata for descriptions of different diseases, and that's a very structured right. international standard. I'm involved in a similar project with a hospital in the UK. So I think in academia and medicine, metadata languages are already there. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're doing a project, a research project with a UK automotive company. OK, I call it UK. It's, not, it's Indian, but I won't go into any details. Uh, and we're helping that company come up with an engineering metadata language for their business. And that's where we started with them. And that's taken, we're into year three now. <laughs> and we haven't actually. Yep. done anything. <laughs> We've got the language and we can call this widget and that widget consistently now yeah. across the business. And yeah, you're right. If you, st if you just start there, it can be problematic because you add out of steam before you've given any return back yeah. to the business. Yeah. It's interesting. We were looking at Teradata recently and they have some data models for different industries already in place, which are, might be 80%, uh, you know, 80% as a starting point, uh, and from what I saw, it was pretty comprehensive. Matter of fact, it's a lot more comprehensive than we actually need. But the kind of the thought was, is could we jumpstart that yeah, activity? Exactly. Because you know, it's probably not that different, right? We're not that special. Yeah, you need to look for standards that already exist and adopt them if you can. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right, folks, thank you so much. And thank you, gentlemen, so much for helping us out with this session. Thank you. Yeah.